Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. At the time of the Han Dynasty, some 2,000 years ago, scholars defined China as a nation of virtue and social etiquette. At the core of this virtue and etiquette was a system of belief known as Li and Yue. Now, Li and Yue are pretty hard to define, but roughly speaking, they comprise a set of norms and protocols by which people can live harmoniously in society. In fact, after 5,000 years, they are still widely observed today. Well, over the years, a number of bronze objects have been discovered that have helped to explain the origins of Li and Yue. Unlike other parts of the world, where the rise of bronze culture can be seen in the development of weapons and tools for practical use, the bronze culture of ancient China was centered on religious activities. In their governing of the country, and for that purpose, the rulers of the Western Zhou Dynasty during the 11th century BC devised rigid rules about the use of these ritual bronze objects. In the process, two abstract concepts emerged, Li and Yue. While Li translates into English as behavior code and social etiquette, the term Li implied much more than this phrase suggests, and Yu, which translates as music, covered a wider range than suggested by the word music. The strong belief in Li and Yu distinguished ancient Chinese civilization from any other in the world, and the social norms and protocols that were born out of them were passed down through history to be followed by later generations, even to the present day. Chinese civilization was unique in its use of this system of Li and Yue, a system that was known to all Zhou dynasty people. The ancestors of the Zhou people, whose tribe was called Cathay, lived on the Yellow Plateau in China's west. Around the 12th century BC, their leader, Dan, led his people to the foot of Mount Qishan. And there, between present-day Fufeng and Qishan counties in Shanxi province, they built a town which became their capital. That town was located at a place now named Zhou Yuan, which means the source of the Zhou people. Many bronze objects have been unearthed in Zhou Yuan to provide tangible evidence of the history of the Zhou people. In December 1976, Bai Xin'en, a farmer from Zhuangbai village, was leveling his field when suddenly he spotted some unusual objects. As soon as they heard of the farmer's finds, archaeologists from Zhou Yuan rushed to the scene. As they carefully removed the earth, they realized they were uncovering layer after layer of neatly stacked bronze objects. In a single pit no more than two meters wide, the archaeologists found no less than 103 items, and this discovery was named the Zhuangbai Number no. 1 Discovery. These bronze objects had belonged to a family of aristocrats named Wei that had been prominent during the Zhou Dynasty. From the inscriptions found on 74 of the pieces, the archaeologists determined that eight workers had been involved in making them and that work on them had begun in the early years of the Western Zhou and had continued for 200 years before they were finally completed. One of the objects bears 284 characters about a number of important events that took place in the early years of the Western Zhou Dynasty. The Qing Tong Rongji Wei Zhongxi in the world is one of the most famous in the world. 
第二个最强突出的特，这些青铜容器上往往有铭文，有文字，而且这文字的内容非常丰富。当然，多数是对自己祖先啊，对王的这个歌颂，但是它记载了很多重要的史实。The characters on these objects reveal that the Wei family was large and wealthy. Every day, for example, they had their meals to the accompaniment of music produced from bronze musical instruments. We know that there were many such noble families in Zhou Yuan. The bronze objects from the Zhuangbai No. 1 discovery had once been in a temple where they were used only on significant occasions, such as ceremonies to memorialize ancestors. The people of Zhou clearly had an awesome respect for their ancestors. All members of the royal family, as well as nobles, had a family temple for memorializing ancestors. But what did such a temple look like? In 1976, a major archaeological excavation carried out in Feng Chu village, Qishan County, Shanxi Province, brought to light the remains of a 3,100-year-old building complex. This building complex was built along a central axis and occupied an area of around 1,470 square meters. Each of the 30 or so houses had three courtyards, with rooms laid out in a very orderly manner on the eastern and western sides. The builders of these houses made use of specialized tools to achieve accurate horizontal and vertical lines. A pole was erected, and a thread with a weight attached to its end was used to check if every line was straight. Then, using the pole as the central point, the builders checked if the circular shape was perfect by comparing shadows at sunrise and sunset. The line connecting the two points formed a straight east-west line. Before the invention of the compass, Ancient Chinese workers determined direction through the shadow from a pole and horizontal level using water. This later led to the birth of a more accurate leveling instrument that we still find highly convenient today. According to archaeologists, these houses were part of a temple complex where major ceremonies were held. The earliest poetry book ever written in Chinese history, the Book of Songs, includes many descriptions of these ceremonies, and through them we learn that, to the accompaniment of musical instruments, Zhou people sang loudly to eulogize their ancestors. Shang had engaged in human sacrifice, but the Zhou people turned to domestic animals for sacrificial purposes. Ancestor worship had been a very important part of life since the Xia dynasty, and it had continued through Shang. But during the Zhou dynasty, ancestor worship ceremonies became even more frequent. These worship ceremonies served as a means to unite the people around the rulers. Chinese culture has a very important role in the 
独一一体的中华民族的共同祖先。所以，对于文化的这种发展，对于社会的发展，对于国家的这种这种稳定，或者对中华民族的凝聚，都具有重要的意义。Ever since then, ancestor worship has been an important tradition in China. Still today, a ceremony is held at the tomb of Huangdi every year at Qingming Festival to worship Huangdi or the Yellow Emperor as the common ancestor of all Chinese people. In point of fact, the temple discovered in Fengchu was just a very small part of the Zhou Royal Buildings. The remains of a much larger building complex have been found in Zhou Yuan, constructed on a high standing base. On either side of the base, there was a road paved with slab stones, on which stood huge pillars spaced out in a very orderly manner. At the site, many broken tiles were found scattered about. According to historical records, tiles first appeared during the Xia Dynasty a long time before the Zhou Dynasty. But by the time of the Zhou Dynasty, Tile making technology had matured, and this can be seen in the great variety of tiles produced in the Zhou Dynasty. Some of these tiles were for roofs, others for decoration, and some bore patterns. Tiles went on to be very important to the development of traditional Chinese buildings. Interestingly, the tiles used for Ming and Qing palaces, glazed or unglazed, are little different in appearance from those used in the Zhou Dynasty more than 3,000 years before. Zhou Dynasty buildings embodied Li and Yue, the concepts that rigidly prescribed what a particular social class could and could not do. This rigid code was followed all the way down to the Ming and Qing dynasties, and can even be seen in the construction of the Forbidden City. But why did these two late dynasties still operate according to this ancient code several thousand years after it was developed? Kong Zi said, "Li Zi Yong, who is Gui?" 礼它可贵在什么地方呢？它就是营造一个和，啊，我们人如果失去了礼，啊，我们身上都是野性，这人就是不和谐的人。我们人跟人之间交往，古代是通过礼，啊，来尊重对方，然后获得对方对我的尊重。Although the capital of the Western Zhou was in Fenghao, Zhou Yuan was also an important place because it was the old hometown of the ancestors of the Zhou people and also the former capital. In Zhou Yuan, there were many family temples and former royal palaces where the king held fairly regular worship ceremonies and received ministers and nobles. Every time a prince or a noble received an honor, a bronze object was made to commemorate the occasion. This was a practice not limited to Zhou Yuan. But seen in other parts of the country as well. Close to the Zhou Dynasty capital, the center, for example, in the Zhou Dynasty, such as some some, for example, in the Zhou Dynasty, the Zhou Dynasty capital, the center of the Qing Dynasty. 往往和周王朝的这个首都附近的相当一致，无论是从纹饰到这个器型，就应该说它是周王朝分封制度所带来的最直接的结果，这种文化的一致性。This identity and consistency meant a universal acceptance of the Zhou dynasty cultural, political, and ideological beliefs, and bronze objects were the vehicle used to spread them. The stories of legendary figures of ancient antiquity, such as Wang Di, Yao Shun, and Da Yu, were adapted into musical performances to be staged at the highest-level worship ceremonies. 
Among these special music dramas were the story of King Wu's punitive expedition against the cruel King Zhou of the Shang dynasty and the story of the ancestors of Shang who brought about the downfall of the earlier Xia dynasty. During the Xia, Shang and Zhou dynasties, the multiple cultures of the Neolithic age merged to become the core of Chinese culture. In the inscriptions found on some Western Zhou bronze objects, the word for China appears. This tells us that the political and cultural connotations of the word were accepted, and gradually it came to be accepted in all parts of the country. Nasung 这是有个传统的，这个中国的礼是有传统的，而这个礼表现在物质上呢，就是礼器。礼器的大部分呢是集中在青铜器上。While well, most of the Li objects in the Zhou Dynasty were made of bronze, so too were a lot of the Yue objects. In fact, the famous Zheng Houyi chimes, the bronze chimes found in the tomb of Marquis Zheng of the Warring States period, were Yue objects. The integration of Li and Yue elevated music to a higher level, so it could function not only in social life, but also in political, military and educational fields. Along with bronze objects such as the Ding and containers of other kinds, also found were bells used for musical performances. If the Ding was the soul of Western Zhou ceremonies, these bronze bells made it flesh and blood. According to historical records, during the Western Zhou dynasty there were more than 70 types of musical instruments. Music was a part of life, and all nobles and scholars valued the ability to appreciate music. In the royal court there was an official in charge of musical education, whose task it was to elevate the ability of aristocrats and scholars through music. The ruler hoped to make all of his subjects calm and peaceful, respectful to parents, and loyal to brothers and sisters through music. According to the ancient book Rituals of Zhou, 1,463 professional musicians worked for the royal family and this number excluded the musicians hired from outside the court for special occasions. So far, no images of a music ensemble working for Western Zhou rulers have been found. However, an accidental discovery made in Sui Shan County, Hubei province in the spring of 1978 gives us some insight as to just how magnificent such an ensemble must have been. After the earth and the massive cover was removed from the top of the tomb of Lord Yi, the ruler of the state of Zhang, a magnificent set of bronze chime bells was revealed. Among the 7,000 bronze items discovered, as many as 125 were music-related. It 
was the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century related to music. The set, made up of 65 pieces in all, was more than 2,400 years old when it was found, yet it was still hanging on its wooden frame in readiness for a performance. The largest of the 65 bells weighs over 200 kilograms, the lightest 2.4 kilograms. The entire set weighs more than 2.5 tons. Each bell bears an inscription, and in all, there are 2,800 characters. They tell of the high level achieved in music during the time of the Western Zhou Dynasty. This extraordinary set of bells, the only ancient musical instrument ever found anywhere in the world capable of producing its original sound, was also the earliest instrument to produce 12 semitones and 5 octaves. In Europe, such a feat was only achieved with the advent of the piano, but that was 2,300 years after the set was made. A special bell placed at the centre of the set was found to be different from the others, and the inscription on the bell tells us about its source. The bell was a gift for Lord E from King Hui of the state of Chu for Lord E and his descendants to enjoy forever. This bell from King Hui of Chu is more than 90 centimetres tall and weighs about 135 kilograms. Yet compared with other bells, it's not particularly impressive in size. But then the relative size of the state of Zhang ruled over by Lord Yi needs to be borne in mind. Compared with its large and powerful neighbour, the state of Chu, the state of Zhang was very small. But if the life of the ruler of Zhang was this luxurious, how luxurious was the life of the ruler of the much larger state of Chu? In the palace of every state during the spring and autumn and warring states periods, a sizable music ensemble and a performance troupe were always ready on hand to perform at a moment's notice. Towards the late Western Zhou, due to social turbulence, many musicians left the royal music ensembles. And when they did, they took with them pieces of music that had previously been performed exclusively for royals and nobles. This royal music gradually became integrated with the music of society at large, and it continued in its function to educate. 中国的这个礼乐就很重要的一点 After the concept of Li and Yu was established during the Zhou dynasty, it quickly became the criterion for any social activity. It was a system that maintained social order, contributed to the stability of the 800-year-long Zhou dynasty, and laid a solid foundation for the cafe culture that would be established later in the Qin and Han dynasties. During the 2000 years that followed, the system of Li and Yu never ceased to function. It continued to play an important part in Chinese history. The concept of Li and Yu became the foundation of Confucianism, 
in which people are encouraged to cultivate themselves while the government consolidates its power. It was also meant to build harmonious human relationships and was the number one criterion for judging any activity. With the passing of time, many trends have come and gone, but belief in Li and Yu has remained throughout Chinese history. Social harmony, peace, respect for others and for one's ancestors, these were all key elements of Li and Yu, and these elements are at the heart of Chinese society today. So, although Li and Yu originated 5,000 years ago, their influence is still very much alive. Thank you for staying with us on New Frontiers and tuning in again next time when we'll bring you more about Chinese civilization. I'm Qi Xiaojun from CCTV International. Bye for now.